up at the break of dawn, plow the fields, wipe the sweat from their brow, make bricks, fill a new blister form on their hand, roast under the blazing sun, try not to hack off their bosses for fear of being physically beat, and then finally, fall into bed beat. This was life for the Israelites, day in, day out, rinse and repeat for 400 plus years. But finally, a day came when it all changed. We read these words in Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 40. Now the length of the time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. How? How did this generation of Israelites move from bondage to freedom? And is there anything that we can learn from their story that will help us move from where we are right now, emotionally, financially, physically, relationally, spiritually, vocationally, to the place that we truly want to be? Well, as we talked about last week, so often this type of move begins with a cry out to God. I take you back to Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23 and 24 as we read last week. Years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to grow under their burden of slavery. Grown under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. And God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob He looked down on the people of Israel and knew, he knew it was time to act. So this question comes to mind, why then? Why not 429 years earlier? This is pure speculation on my part, but I would suggest that God decided to act when he saw that the Israelites realized that they were completely powerless on their own. That they realized that their only hope of things ever changing was for him, God, to intervene on their behalf. You say, seriously, do you really believe that it took them 429 years to figure that out? This is the very first time that the writer mentions that they cried out to God. But at the same time, common sense, logic tells me, you know what? There were probably one or two other prayers that went up before this particular prayer Either way, the writer seems to be emphasizing that the Israelites had reached a point of deep desperation. They didn't ask, they didn't request, they didn't mention that it would be cool if God moved them out of Egypt. The writer says they cried out. Obviously, God doesn't always wait for a person to reach this point of desperation before he chooses to act on their behalf. But I would, I would suggest to you this morning that if you believe that you can handle your circumstances, fix your problems, get to where you want to be on your own, God will allow you to knock yourself out trying. But please know this. Believe this. God acts on behalf of those who realize he is their only hope for a better life. And one of the ways that God often chooses to act is by bringing the right person or persons into their life at the right time. And the right person for the nation of Israel was a man by the name of Moses. In just a few moments, we'll talk a little bit more about Moses. But first, I want you to notice how the Israelites responded to Moses. We continue reading in Exodus chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Upon seeing that Moses and Aaron were godly individuals, the Israelites wisely received them, accepted them. That's something that many of us are hesitant to do at times, isn't it? God brings a godly person into our life that could help us with our marriage, with our parenting, with our spiritual life, and we make the decision rather than to receive them humbly, wisely, we dismiss them. 
Why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons that we could probably come up with this morning. I'm going to mention to you just a few. Let's start right here. All too often, it's because of our pride. We really believe that we already have all the answers. What could another person possibly teach me that I don't already know? You see this in organizations, you see this in churches who refuse outside consultation despite the fact that it's obvious the ship's going down. You see this in individuals who refuse to go to counseling even though it's obvious that their life is on the verge of imploding. Do you know what the writer of Proverbs calls a person like this? Surely you do. Go ahead, shout it out. Calls him a fool. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15, the way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. We must not allow our pride to get in the way of receiving those God has prepared to come help us. Now, a second reason that's close to the first is simply this. We are so prideful, we don't think we need help. God sends someone into our life who says something like this, listen, I've been kind of watching the way that you're doing life, and I'm I'm really concerned. Is there anything that I can do to help you? And our immediate response is this, you know what? Don't be. Don't be concerned. I've got this. One of the hardest things in life to see is our own bondage, to see how we're sabotaging our own lives to see how we're failing to live up to our potential, to see the harm that we're doing in the lives of other people. Now, one of the things that I believe is that the Holy Spirit often sends up a request to God before the words even form in our mouths. God hears that and acts on that request. And oftentimes what the Holy Spirit does or God's response is this, is that he sends somebody into our lives to help us to express concern, to say, I'm here for you. Now, does that mean that every single person who offers to help is from God? No, it doesn't. Most of us receive an offer for help almost every single day, but usually it comes from somebody who's trying to sell us something, right? And so that's not necessarily a person from God. But when a person comes to you who truly cares about you and loves you, you need to pay attention to what they have to say. Because most likely they're seeing something in your life that you don't see, you can't see, or you don't want to see. So the next time your spouse comes to you and says, hey, listen, I'm really concerned because I notice you're burning the candle at both ends of the stick. How can I help you? At least be open to the possibility that they are an answer to an unspoken prayer that God has sent them your way before you choose to just blow them off with a, hey, don't be concerned about me. I've got this. Another reason that we are prone to dismiss people that God sends our way at times is because of a, it's a fragile ego. One of the biggest career regrets that I have in my life goes back to 1992. Uh, I was in my second year of campus ministry And an elder, just an incredibly gracious, humble man who is a really dear friend and was a friend then, made an offer to me over lunch at Olive Garden. He said this, he said, hey, Sean, he said, I I would be willing to sit in every class that you teach, listen to you teach, critique that, and then offer you helpful feedback. Do you know what I should have said at that particular moment? I should have said, you know what, that would be amazing, Bailey. Thank you so much. Did I? (laughs) No, I didn't. What I said instead was this, that is a very kind offer. I'll get back to you. Did I get back to him? No, I did not. Why not? Because at the time, my fragile ego could not handle that type of constructive criticism. The same can be true today. Not necessarily about speaking. I've realized over the years there's tremendous value in receiving feedback from certain people. Let me emphasize that, from certain people, okay? (laughs) But there are other parts of my life in which I still have a fragile ego. And I'm guessing I'm not alone. I'd be willing to bet that just about every single person in this audience does as well. It might be about your dating life. 
It might be about your marriage, about your parenting, about your relationship with God. But you just don't want feedback because it tends to undo you. And even when it's said from a place of love, to have somebody point out your weaknesses or where you're not measuring up or ways that you can improve, it can feel crushing. The temptation is to bury our head in the sand, but the only way to move forward in life is to be willing to face reality. And so how do you receive the truth without being undone by it? You really need to have your identity rooted deeply in God to understand that you are a child of God, that he loves you perfectly and always will, that he has a plan for your life and nothing, nothing is ever going to change that. The deeper your identity is rooted in God, the more likely you will be to receive the helpful feedback from other people. And so if you find yourself struggling at times, I don't want to hear criticism about my parenting or my marriage or my walk with Jesus Christ or whatever it may be, back up for a moment and ask yourself, where's my true value coming from? Am I finding all of my value in raising great kids? Am I finding all of my value in this marriage that everybody else seems to think is perfect? Am I finding all of my value in the way I present at work? Those things are not strong foundations. They'll crumble beneath you. And so go back to rooting your identity in Jesus Christ. Then you can face reality. Then you can move forward to the place that you truly want to be. Now let me mention one other reason that sometimes we dismiss the people God brings into our life to help us. We don't really want help. Oh, sure, we cry out to God when it feels like the consequences are about to rain down on us, when there's the threat of a job loss, when a spouse threatens to walk out of the marriage, when the doctor says one more cheeseburger and you're going to have a heart attack. In those particular moments, we cry out to God and say, God, we need your help. Please intervene. Do something for us. But as soon as the crisis passes, we dismiss those individuals that God has sent our way who could truly help us. The question we need to ask ourselves long before we cry out to God is the question that Jesus asked of the paralytic. The question was simply this in John chapter 5 and verse 6. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Do you truly want to move from where you are right now to where you want to be? If you do, if the answer is yes then you can trust God will send someone to you or point you in the direction of someone to go to who can help you take your next step to a better life. I was reminded of that a couple of years ago when I read a post from DJ Iverson. DJ is a youth minister in San Diego. He wrote a post about losing a friend, a dear friend by the name of Lynn Evans. And just a bit of background, Lynn was or served with National Network of Youth Ministers for several several years. As you will hear in DJ's post, God sent Lynn into his life at just the right time. DJ shared this. Dear God, this one hurts. I met Lynn at a youth ministry conference days after I'd been let go from my first full-time position. He was a counselor for youth pastors, and I was very lost at the time, not sure if I wanted to continue in ministry. We instantly bonded over baseball, and he said God would forgive me for sneaking into the conference because I was broke. He also got a kick out of me asking for an autograph of his youth ministry curriculum book. We talked over a few days, and he was a huge source of encouragement for me. Sometimes God sends the right people into your life at the right moment, Lynn was one of those people. We've stayed in contact over the years. He was the only Red Sox fan I congratulated after they won in 2018. My inbox is full, absolutely full of encouragement from him. Anytime he came across an article about Tony Gwynn, he'd send it my way with some kind of encouraging word and always praying for you in your ministry. As much as it hurts to think that I won't be seeing his name pop up in my inbox a few times a week, 
I fully trust that God has welcomed, welcomed him into glory with a well-done, good, and faithful servant. There's no more important ministry or service than you can be involved in to, than to show up for those who are in need of help. And that brings our focus back to Moses. When the Israelites cried out for help, God chose Moses to send to them. We read these words in Exodus 3, verse 9 and 10. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now this may be hard for some of you to believe, but hear me out on this for just a moment. There will be a time or times that someone cries out to God for help. And when God hears that prayer and he looks at that situation, it will be your name that comes to his mind. Your name. He's going to tap you to help that person move forward with his or her life. Out of bondage, out of the same old rut, into a better life. God believes you. Not the person next to you, not the person across the row from you. God believes you will be the perfect person to help that person move forward with their life. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Now Moses didn't. Listen to his response in verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? It's not hard to understand why Moses felt like God had tapped the wrong person. After all, Moses had made a bit of a mess of his life. What kind of mess? Well, listen to this part of his story. Chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 and verse 15. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one he killed the Egyptian and had him hid in the sand. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. If you think that God would never use you to lead people onto a better life because you have some skeletons in your closet, this part of the story reminds us that past mistakes, past mistakes do not qualify us from future usefulness in God's plan. In fact, oftentimes it's our past mistakes, it's our past hurts and disappointments that make us the perfect person to help a person move forward with his or her life. I mean, for instance, who better to help a person who is struggling with addiction than a person who has come through addiction? Who better to help a person make it to the other side of grief than a person who has actually been through addiction? grief. The very things that you've gone through in your life, your hurts, disappointments, failure, is the exact reason you are the perfect person to help someone else with their present troubles, their present struggles today. Now, another reason that Moses might have felt that he was the wrong person, that God had tapped the wrong guy on the shoulder, shoulder was simply because of his age. Moses was old. He was old. How old? He was 80 years old. That's old. That's the perfect age to go be a Walmart greeter, but not lead a mass exodus, right? I mean, that's a young man's game. But this part of the story reminds us that, that age it really doesn't matter to God. Young, old, anywhere in between, he can use you to help per, another person move forward with their life. Now, the older you are, the more wisdom you have to share with other people, hopefully. The younger you are, the more energy you have, right? I was reminded of that this past week. I think it was Tuesday night. I got a phone call from Brian Schrader. It was 7 o'clock or so. Brian called. He said, hey, Lauren's not feeling well. Do you want to go to the Sharks game tonight? He's a young guy. Brian's thinking, I can be out late. It doesn't matter what time I get home. I'll get up with plenty of energy in my life. I'll be ready to go. That's what he has. He's blessed with energy. I'm not quite as young. I was standing in line at Chipotle. I looked at my watch. I thought, what well, by the time we get there, it'll be 7.30, 8 o'clock when that game starts. 
It'll go a couple hours. If I don't be in bed by 9 o'clock or so, I'm going to be cranky the next day. I have wisdom. And so out of wisdom, I said, thank you, Brian, but I need much more advance notice than this to go hang out with you late at night. I love the way the writer of Proverbs puts this. He says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 29, the glory of the young is their strength. The gray hair of experience is the splendor of the old. Or in Sean's translation, the baldness is the splendor of the old. <laughs> Age is never a reason to say no when God calls you to help another person move forward in their life. And of course, the most obvious reason that Moses felt like he was the wrong guy tapped by God was simply because he didn't feel like he was gifted to help. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. You ever been there? There are so many instances in which I'm hesitant to step into a situation, especially when it's dealing with somebody that I care deeply about. Because I'm scared to death that I won't have the right words to say or whatever words that I might say will be the wrong words that I say. But please know this. Please believe this. God will provide. He will provide. He will equip you to do what he is asking you to do. Listen to the words that God said to Moses in return, verse 11 and 12. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say. Now, this assurance from God, it still wasn't enough for Moses to overcome his fear. And so what did God do? Well, God said, okay, here's what I'm going to do for you, Moses, because you're still has it. I'm going to send your brother who's well-spoken. He's going to go with you, Aaron. And I'm also going to put a staff in your hand, and that staff is going to allow you to do some convincing proofs. So I'm going to give you everything that you need. I want you to remember that this morning. God won't send us without equipping us. He won't send us without equipping us. In fact, right now, God's equipping you in ways that you do not fully realize. Just as God equipped Moses to lead people out of Egyptian captivity by allowing him to spend 40 years leading sheep in Midian... There are some experiences that you're having right now in your life that are equipping you for your next job assignment. He's preparing you because he knows where he wants you to be and what he wants you to do, so he's getting you ready right now. God will equip you to do what he's asking you to do. But more importantly than that, hold on to this. God will go with you. He will go with you. This is the assurance that he gives to Moses in verse 11 and 12. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. I'll be with you. And we find Jesus, God in flesh, making the exact same promise to those that he was sending to help people out of their bondage. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Right now, someone is in bondage. Right now, Someone is crying out. Right now, God is listening. Right now, God is getting ready to act. Right now, God is thinking of you. And you can believe that you can go in confidence because God is going to go with you. May we be responsive this week. So God taps us on the shoulder to make a difference in the lives of people.